Institute, which it took me a long time to remember, but it means charting the future. And once you remember it, it's a really cool name. Um, so with that, Jonathan, thank you so much for all your work, and he's going to share that, and then we'll move on from there. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, thank you so very much. I can't tell you how truly excited I am to be here and to see all of you. But before we go any further, could you please give it up for Sandy? Get back here. With Sandy talking about all the um, you know, higher purpose and this, that, and the other, I'm to be the yang to her yin. She's supposed to elevate things, I'm supposed to ground them and uh, set a very lar low bar so that all the subsequent speakers can get over it. So that's my job. Um, and look, it works. Okay, um, this is a general outline of what I would like to do today over the next period of time. Um, I, as Sandy indicated, I've done a public opinion survey about attitudes of people in our region. And there's an awful lot of material there and so what I've done is really try to compress it into a few essential points, the findings of the survey. There was a lot of stuff left on the editing floor, um, and I'll be talking about that in a longer session in October uh, at the library on October 24th. Also, I'm gonna have to go through this stuff pretty quickly because there are time constraints, and there will be copies of this uh, slide deck available you can either get in touch with me or Sandy or Sue on Monday, and, for, and all these slides will be available to you. And I, of course, happy to answer any questions, and hopefully I'll get through this in quickly enough that we can have a question and answer time after um, I get through the slides. So, let's talk about the genesis. How did we get here? And if you go back a year, I was running for re-election to the Jackson Town Council, and a lot of people came up to me it seemed um, they were very concerned about where our community is and where it's going. And so by community, I mean this one place, this the water doesn't stop, air doesn't stop, animals don't stop. The only, we, we have political boundaries, but we're basically one community spanning two states and three counties. And to the best of my knowledge, nobody had ever asked in a scientifically rigorous way What's going on? And that, it, that got me thinking because all these people who are really, they care about this place so much and they're so worried about it. And I thought, is this fluky? Is this an anomaly or is there actually something going on here? Unfortunately, we didn't have any data from, be, from before, but if the second best time to plant a tree is today, then the idea was if we could get this going and we can do a regular survey to judge how we as a community are doing, how are people feeling? And so about six months ago, Sandy and I started talking about this, and the net result was getting some funding to do the survey, and we're funded for the next couple of years. So it'll be interesting to see how things progress. So there are two pillars really underlying the structure of the survey that I'm gonna be talking about. <clears throat> and the first is the uh, vision of the comp plan, the Jackson Teton County comp plan was adopted in 2012, it was reaffirmed in 2020. And there's a typo in here and there are a couple, uh, so thank you for your indulgence. But the comp plan is a really powerful, has a really powerful vision statement. These are 21 words are the first words in the comp plan. Preserve and protect the area's ecosystem. And why do we wanna do that? In order to ensure a healthy environment, community, and economy and not just for current generations, as it says on the screen, but for current and future generations. That's an extraordinarily powerful vision. And as you'll see, these themes of economy, community, and environment will work its way through the presentation. The other foundational piece of the survey were the three basic questions of strategic planning. Where am I? Where do I wanna be? How do I get there? And again, we're trying to lay down some baseline information here. So the first question that we're really asking is, where am I? Where are we as a community? Let's figure that out and then we can start building and growing and figuring out where we want to go and how we might be able to assess how we're doing getting there. So what did we do? Well, 
we set up two parallel um, surveys. The first one was a scientifically valid 350 random phone calls in the three county area. The second one, which commenced after the phone survey, was an open all comers, and we ended up with just uh, shy of 900 uh, responses to that. So all told, we're gonna end up somewhere around 13, 1400 responses, so roughly 3% of all the adults in the three county area of Teton Valley, Idaho, T Jackson Hole Valley here, and Star Valley in, in Wyoming. And when you do the math, with a random survey like that, we have a margin of error about plus or minus about 5.2%. If we'd taken it up to 400 or 500, it that would have, margin of error would have declined just a little bit. So it's a pretty representative survey, particularly because while we got a pretty good representation of the overall population, we also changed the weighting a little bit on some of this, on the responses to more accurately reflect, the best accurately reflect what's really going on in our region. So what did we find out? And I want to point out that the, the next group of slides, even though I mentioned the online, the next group of slides just talks about the phone survey. So these are pretty good data about how we as a community view ourselves and our future. So the first big takeaway, we really like this place. We love living here. And just to give you a sense of how these graphs work, so on the x-axis here, or the y1 axis here, this is the number of responses out of the 350. So these bars represent how many responses we got. And these were 0 to 10, 0 being negative, 5 being neutral, 10 being the most favorable. So you know, roughly 35, a little over a third of people said they really, 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 really like living here. This dot represents the mean score. So again, 5 is neutral. So 8.4, it suggests people really like living here. They not only like living here, but they aren't anticipating moving. So we asked another question, do you anticipate moving? And roughly 70% said, probably not, or certainly not. And two in five said, uh-uh, I'm here. Again, people really love living here. And that's the starting place for thinking about how we do this. Why do people love living here? And the answer is the environment. The uh, <clears throat> mean of 9.1. Second place was the community, 8.4, and then 8.0, that was how important they feel each of these things are. But again, the, the thing that's really striking is not just the environment, but these are the scores of how, of how people rated it. And nearly two-thirds of everybody gave the environment, uh, uh, rated it as 10 in their, it's their importance to them. And community, 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 interestingly, it wasn't until seven that a majority of people started putting the economy ahead. And you know, basically, if you do the math, there were sort of 20 curmudgeonly people who responded to the survey who either said they didn't like the environment or it wasn't important to them at all. Uh, so we'll find them. Uh, we'll weed them out. It's, it's, it's part of the master plan. That's why you guys are all here. You didn't know it. Um, anyway, so it's the environment. It's the community, it's the economy, in that order. But we are concerned about where the community is going, where the region is going. And we asked a very simple question. Do you feel like we are heading in the right direction or the wrong direction? Over a third of people said strongly wrong. Another, 20, another quarter said somewhat wrong. And you know, also notable is how few people said strongly right. And so as a, as a region, we have this sense that things are just not going quite right. Why is that? Because people feel as though things are worse now than when they moved here. And again, five is neutral. So this is the first time we've seen any score coming in below five. So people are pretty uncomfortable. Again, four was the most popular response, and you can see how it's sort of spread over here, but people are, feel as though something has gone on over the period of time, whether it's 90 years they, was the, the most time anybody had lived here in our responses, and under a year is the, is the shortest period of time. 
but there's a sense that something just isn't right. Well, if you ask folks how things are at the moment, well, you know, the economy seems to be decent. Community, a little less so. Environment seems to be pretty healthy. But if you ask them, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future? So in this case, 10 would be very optimistic, zero would be very pessimistic. The thing to draw your attention to, or if people think about the future of the community, whatever that may mean to them, they're neither optimistic nor pessimistic. There's a sort of a deep-seated concern there that just keeps showing up in the comments, in, in the scores, all over. And so, as far as the fifth takeaway point, I, as I was going through this, it struck me, and I developed this term, this metric, that I call the hope gap. What do I mean by that? Well, again, the, the high score for what the environment was was 9.1, that's pretty high. But when you ask people how, how important it was, but when you ask them how optimistic they are about its future, it was only 6.1. Well, if you subtract the one from the other, you get a negative three, and if you divide that into the, how optimistic they are, there's a score there. You can, you can develop a metric, and to me, that's the gap, the, the gap between how important it is to you and how optimistic you're feeling about it. I call that the hope gap. And let's take a closer look at that. So what I did here is I just took the mean scores from all these different things I had up on the screen. So here's the importance of the environment, importance of the community, do you like living in the area? Importance of the economy. Up here we have optimism. Are things better or worse? How optimistic are you about the community, about the economy, about the environment? Well, if you put all these things together, and if the button works, there we go, you can calculate an average. So stuff around here is really important. Again, people really love living here. They care deeply. Uh, they think things are going pretty well. Seven out of 10 ain't bad. But their optimism level, the collective optimism level about all this, it's not so great. Now let's take these same things and restructure, reorganize them. So down here we have everything about the environment, here about community, here about the economy, and then how much do you like living in the area and are they getting better or worse? Well, let's do the same sort of thing except let's calculate a hope gap. So people are reasonably hopeful by this metric about where the economy is and where it's going. There's not much of a gap. There's more of one with the economy, but look what's going on with the community and ultimately are things getting better or worse versus how much do we like living here? So what this is telling me is that there's some sort of deep angst going on and you can do the same thing, which I did. We asked a bunch of demographic questions as well. So we asked, how are your political views? How much do you make? How long have you lived in the area? Do you own or rent? Do you have children or no children? Age, where do you live? And you can see that there's, you know, we're, everybody's about the same. There's a, a degree, there's a gap between how much we care about this place and our level of optimism. In some cases, like, this is really shocking to me or striking to me, that the younger you are, the less optimistic, the less, the less hopeful you are. And it seems to me that I as a leader in my elected position, but we as a community, if we can try and close that gap, if we can try and do something to elevate hope, then we've done something really extraordinary. So, then the question is, what's going on? Why, what's, what's really happening here? And so we had eight different open-ended questions that we looked at. And in the 350 telephonic response, uh, survey, we had over 2,500 responses. That's a lot of words to go through. And then when you add in the, um, the online, they're like, you're pushing 10,000 different responses. So it's gonna, it's gonna take me a while to read through all those, um, to put it mildly. But what I did was I took I tried to summarize the responses to the first three questions just to give you a sense of some of the power, the explanatory power of this survey. So the first question that we asked is, what do you think of the major issues here? And hello, 
Who knew, right? Yeah. Tell me something I didn't know. Um, and then the next question was, the second question was, tell us things you like about living here. Well, you had sense of community, community offerings, recreation, outdoor sports. So basically it boils down to, again, these two things that are the most important. The uh, environment got 9.1, community got 8.4. It's very much reflected in the comments that people made. So there's a nice consistency there, which is great. And then, of course, the flip side is, what don't you like? Well, it really boiled down to three buckets. Uh, traffic, who knew? Uh, cost of living and growth. And growth takes on different types of things, whether it's you know, the community feel and population, growth in tourism, influx of wealth. This is, of course, my favorite. We hate everything. <laughs> We're gonna find those people, too, because you know those are the environmental people. Anyway, um, but so the question is, so if you, if you take a look at this, what does this start telling you about where you wanna go? Well, so these are, this is a work in progress and we're just trying to evaluate the data, but some certain patterns are developing that we as, as we shape the future of this community, and one of the driving points of the work that I do uh, professionally is that if we can understand basic principles of stuff going on in Jackson Hole, they're probably applicable to every other nice place because we may be special, but we're not unique. There are a lot of other really great places in the world and the information that we can take. And I'm guessing that, it, you know, regardless of where you go, like um, I was talking to a friend on Cape Cod this morning and they're dealing with a lot of these things. So it's just, these things are popping up. And so the real opportunity for all of us as leaders is to try and figure out how can we address these in a way that again is gonna close that hope gap. So, I mentioned the online survey. It is, I, I'm just gonna give it a brief hello because in part because it closed yesterday. Um, but it's got, we, I had two goals in doing it. One was I was just, I wanted to give everybody who had, wanted to comment a chance to do so. I was also curious intellectually, how will the results of that compare to what we got from tele, the telephone survey? Well, it turned out that it was a different demographic group. So in the telephone survey, about half the people we surveyed were from uh, Teton County, Wyoming, half, a quarter from Star Valley, and a quarter from Teton Valley, which is about right with the population. Um, here we had th almost 80% were from Jackson Hole. So it was a very Jackson Hole, and it was an older crowd. And so these are things that we'll try to address going forward, but it's what we got. And basically what it showed us is that people, and it gets back to the passion for the place, people were really fired up. The people who were responding, they were more passionate about the environment, more passionate about the community, less so about the economy, and they were more disappointed, more cynical, crusty old farts if you want. Okay. So for me, there were five major conclusions to draw from this. And the first is, again, we love the place, we, we love it to death, but we're really worried about its future. And what this did for me was validate that the stuff that I was hearing a year ago when I was running for office, it wasn't just noise. There was something really going on there that seemed very different than in the past. And now with the baseline data, we'll be able to judge whether that actually accelerates or whether we can try and change the arc of that. The second thing that it did is it really validated, so 30, 11 years ago, 2012, the town and county adopted the vision statement, preserve and protect the area's ecosystem in order to ensure a healthy environment, or community and economy. And there was a lot of, there's a lot of value in that and we overlook it at our peril, I think. Number three, housing is absolutely a critical concern. I mean, that's a no brainer, but what was instructive to me is that ecosystem health ranked so highly. So there's an awful lot of examples in the history of the world of, of destroying ecosystems in the name of housing and we have to find that balance. The other thing that was interesting um, is, again, there's a great passion for community and one of the things I left on the editing room floor was just a slide talking about how um, most people in this region are satisfied with their housing. 
which kind of goes against the popular buzz, and a majority are not having financial concerns with their housing. And so we'll talk about that more when I do the presentation at the library, but there's an awful lot going on here, so we can focus on housing because it's a critical need, but we, we make a mistake if we make that our monomaniacal focus at the expense of the environment or the larger sense of community. By tearing apart into the demographic data, we could come at point four, and the question is, what is the fabric of the community? And so the people who are expressing the most pessimism, the place where the hope gap is the biggest, are those who are basically people who are trying to build a life here. They're in their, they're sort of in their middle of their building a career, trying to raise a family, and they're feeling very pessimistic. And so if we're gonna focus on that, and it gets, into, it gets into this point about how well are our housing efforts, a lot of the housing we're doing is, is developing small little studio apartments and things like that. But the question is how well does that fit the actual need? And the data suggests that the, the folks that we really should be most worried about are sort of those people between 25 and 40, people who are trying to raise a family, people who are feeling a lot of pressure on a lot of different fronts. And then finally, the hope gap. And the hope gap, again, was people, whether they take the economy for granted or whether they're so comfortable they don't need to worry about it or whether they're just skids and they don't care about it. Um, we've got the hope gap is really the greatest for the concerns about the environment and the community. So next steps. Let's talk a little bit about leadership. Why are we all here? The Teton, because we're inaugurating the Teton Leadership Center. And it seems to me leadership really boils down to three different things. First thing you do is you identify and you diagnose a problem. Second thing is you develop a solution. And then the third thing is you lead people in the direction of that proposed solution. And, but the key to that thing, and Sandy alluded to it in her remarks, what's the vision? What's the vision there that you're trying to lead people to? What's gonna inspire them to follow you as a leader? Well, going back to vision, and I'll, I'll repeat it, it's we have this extraordinary vision statement in the comp plan, preserve and protect the area's ecosystem. Look, I got it right there. Um, but if you start breaking it down into its components, environment, community, economy, and you ask yourself, what are we really doing? What are we really doing to preserve and protect in order to have healthy ones of each of these. Well, we do an awful lot for the economy, public sector, private sector, obviously, and the nonprofit sector, too. We've got an extraordinary chamber of commerce. We're so lucky to have it. There's lots of stuff going on. What about the environment? What do we do to try and boost that? Well, we kind of do a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of the town of Jackson because we created a position called Ecosystem Stewardship Administrator, and no other place in America has that, maybe not even in the world. But there's not much we can do, particularly for the number one priority. And then the health of the community just sort of becomes an afterthought. But if you think about what it is that people really care about, what stitches us together? We're a community, all of us in this room right here. We sort of take that for granted, and people are, again, people are really, really worried about losing that. So, well, you could say, well, but we don't know what to do about that, but that's the exact point. That's why we're here today, because there are these huge, audacious problems out there that nobody's figured out how to solve, and that's the opportunity. Over the course of the next 24 hours, we're going to be able to try and figure out how to solve those, We're going, or at least... As Sandy said, we don't have answers, but we got a lot of questions. We got a lot of really smart, passionate people in this room who want to start tackling big, important questions. And so, to that end, I would just, with a call for action, the survey really shone a light on a lot of very interesting challenges, challenges that people nowhere have figured out how to address. And I'm wondering if one of the things that the Teton Leadership Center can do is start developing, just right out of the gate, a focus on the kinds of things that the survey has revealed as being of incredible concern to this community. So one final note, I mentioned if you're interested in finding out more about this, um, on October 24th, so in about a month, 
Uh, TLC has arranged for me to give a talk at the library where I'll go over this stuff in much more detail. I'll have, a lot, I'll have more time to analyze it. And so with that, I would just like to thank the sponsors. Thank you all so much for coming and being interested in, in taking this journey that we're all just starting now. And with that, I'll open up to any questions. So thank you very much. So if you have questions, um, please feel free to shout them out. I don't think they're mics. I will repeat any questions that come up. Oh, there's some green thing being tossed around. I do not know what that means. Who's got questions? I'm going to throw this at you. Anyone have a question? There's one. Wait, here we go. Speak into the box. Think. Oh, does that work? Wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, in regards to the higher cost of living, eat the you, box. <laughs> do you have any any data on how much our how much higher our cost of living truly is, or is, because I have a feeling that could be something that's sort of framed it that way, and I'm curious what the true reality is. If I heard you correctly, and I'm not sure, it's it's not the most acoustically perfect box. Let's just put it that way. I think you asked, do I have do we have much information on whether our cost of living is actually that much higher here? Was that the essence of the question? Okay. The, the best thing that we have is the state of Wyoming puts out something, a, a semi-annual cost of living index. And the long and the short of it is that we always lead the state in cost of living because we always lead the state in housing and housing counts for about 50% of their index. If you look for other things, things are really not that much higher here. And in many ways, like we have the cheapest electricity in the country, um, you know, our tax base, as, as painful as it can be, our property taxes are low. We obviously have an estate income tax. Our sales taxes are relatively low. So on most things, we're not that much different than the rest of the world, but on most things doesn't include the big elephant in the room, which is housing. And there, to go into a little bit more detail than you want, but we have this barbell of an economy. We have the highest, we're the wealthiest county in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We have the highest per capita income, by, it's not even close. We're at like 320,000 and second place county is 195. I mean, it's ridiculous. At the other end, we're in the top 10 of all US counties in the proportion of tourism related jobs. And they pay traditionally very poorly. So we got a whole bunch of poorly paying jobs, a whole bunch of high-end stuff, and the grinding is, is the people in the middle, those people who are expressing concern about living here. So how much higher are we than other places? That's really hard to say because that sort of gets into what do we pay as wages, but housing is crushing us, particularly given our tourism, uh, the, the large number of tourism jobs we have. Karen. Thank God that is in Teton County, which is out of my jurisdiction, and I can't answer that. Uh, <laughs> it's just right on the other end of High School Road. The question in there, if, if for those of you who didn't hear it, was uh, why are we having such a hard time developing or seizing an opportunity for affordable housing for not just not just the uh, single young worker, but the family, the kind of people who the survey identified? Is that a fair summary of your question? Yeah, and um, I mean, I, I I hate to sound like a prevaricating politician, but that has, the town and county talked about this three years ago, and the county said, by God, that's in our jurisdiction. 
and we're going to take care of it in town. Don't you bother us. And so I haven't put much more, I don't know too much more about it than you do as a newspaper reader. And I share your frustration. I hear it. And I feel really inadequate giving you this answer, but it's the best I got. Yeah. So. Oh, hey, Jordan. Hi, Jonathan. Um, I know you and I have chatted a little bit about this, about the difficulty in reaching um, young people and Spanish speakers with a survey. But I was curious if you could share at the end um, what those percentages of respondents. Oh, they were horrible um, for Latinos? or um, And for young people. Oh, young people. Um, I think I can go back. Maybe I can't. Oh, look at that. Here we go. So this was the phone survey. So it wasn't quite as high as I would have liked, but and it's it's not. But part of the problem is, um, you know, who is a resident, and if you're here for if you're here for, as a summer a seasonal worker, then so the two categories where we fell short. And, and where I'm gonna try and do more active outreach, working with you with the Hispanic community, but also um, we know we fell short with, the, um, with younger people. We gotta figure out some strategies to, to boost that up. Um, we, we don't have those. I've tried a couple of other outreach things and it was rebuffed on those. So um, it's, you know, this isn't perfect. Um, but it's, it's strongly suggestive. So that's the best I can offer to you. <laughs> just, just shout it out, Peter, and I'll repeat it. Well, this was the, uh, you know, that's why I entitled it The Fabric of the Community. Um, if only there were a Teton County Commissioner in the room, then you could, you could beat them up. Um, I, 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 no, it's, it's an extraordinary problem because the, all these trends were happening before COVID started. And what happened with COVID is that it accelerated this process of, we, of our making of this massive shift from something we were to something we are turning into and the best explanation I can give to you about the cause, and I'll get back to your specific question, but if you go back 30 years, the defining, play, the defining quality of this place was geographic isolation, not just because of the mountains and the valley and, and how it has defined the community, but because it was so damned hard to get in and out of here. And as a result, there was a pretty tight umbilical cord, if you will, between the local economy and housing and all these other things. And what's happened over the last 30, 35 years, that umbilical cord has gotten stretched and frayed and, and cut. Because thanks to this, we can go anywhere in the world we want to. So the same basic problems are happening Every special place in the world, any place that's desirable, they've got the same basic suite of problems. Affordable housing, traffic, growing income inequality, a displaced middle class. There's tremendous, and COVID just poured gasoline on that fire. On top of that, what takes us from special to truly unique is we have a fully functioning ecosystem. And that's, and nobody's really figured out how to preserve that as well. So we got this really involved suite of pro problems and all the economic incentives are working and it's to Karen's question as well. The cost of housing and the profitability for developers has gotten 
you know, everything is going into high-end homes because that's where the money is. That's how our system works and how it's supposed to work. But it's it's really eroding the, the quality of the community because it's making it hard. And we as local government don't have a dedicated funding source that we can use to try and do that. So that's part of the reason that we advocate for a real estate transfer tax or go to Cheyenne and try and get up, get other forms of money because until we have a dedicated form of um, funding for housing, it's gonna continue to be a problem. So we're, we're doing a little bit here, a little bit there. We're, we're making some progress, but I can't be too terribly hopeful. Um, but I, we can ask the questions and that's the kind of thing that I hope is coming out of something like this forum. Sure. Yeah. Back uh, here is, oh, right here. there you are. Hi. Um, so hey, it works. I, I come from the nonprofit community, I guess, and there was something in one of your slides that said that the nonprofit organizations might be a reflection of the strength of the community and the economics of it. Um, I happen to, I don't know, I'm very impressed with the nonprofit presence in both valleys, but I'm also kind of concerned because I think, or maybe my question is, why is that a reflection of health? It seems to me that it's a reflection of gaps um, that need to constantly be filled by philanthropy instead of by the force of the community and the strength of its economy and the health of its economy. I yes. don't know if that's a question. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I'll say yes. Um, here's my bit. So the essence of the question was, does a more active nonprofit world actually reflect a weakness in society? And if I can create a framework for answering that, it's very clear what the private sector is supposed to do. You make money. And it's a very simple metric for doing that. You take how much you get for selling a good or service, you subtract the cost of it. If the number is positive, you're a success. If not, we don't have a similar kind of metric for measuring success for things. And we don't, we don't ask the private sector to do things that don't make money. But there's a bunch of stuff that happens in our world that we as people, we as society, we as culture, that you can't make money off of. And depending on your, um, the government, sometimes the government takes a little bit of that, sometimes it does a lot. But there are a lot of things that fall between the cracks. And that's really the reflection of the nonprofit sector. And so it, I don't know that there's, there's two sides of that coin I would argue to you. One is, <clears throat> you know, certain people would have the belief that government should take over a lot more of that. And that's more of a Scandinavian country kind of model. The other is, isn't it great that we have such a robust nonprofit community because there are all these needs that are getting addressed that otherwise would fall between the cracks. And so the fact that we have such a vital philanthropy um, in this community and on the other side of the hill, that could be re viewed as a good thing. You may not like the reason it's there, but the fact that we're filling so much of it, I think is probably the answer to your, the best I can do to answer your question. So yeah, you could say it's, it's a reflection of a, of a struggling society but by God, we're putting a lot of money into it and we're trying to do what we can. That's the best I got for you. All right, I think we're running out of time. So. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Oh.